Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. This is the penultimate episode in the 10-part series dealing with the crime scene evidence deep dives. Uh, it's quite incredible, I think, that we, in the middle of November, uh, it's about a month and a half since the Netflix documentaries come out and there's still so much interest in this case. In any event, in this episode, we are going to be looking at uh, the vehicles. If you think about the crime scenes in the Chris Watts case, um, there is the house, 2825 Saratoga Trail. There's also the well site at Survey 319. But another aspect that is often um, underestimated when we think about crime scenes are the vehicles. And of course, a vehicle was used to transport uh, at least one uh, dead body, maybe two, maybe three, but was definitely part of the process of um, concealing the crime and getting rid of evidence. We are going to be looking at around about five different areas to do with the vehicles. This is by no mean by no means a complete and th absolutely thorough analysis of the subject we're kind of going to go through it in detail but not sort of exhaustive detail we're starting with the 215 ford lariat f250 work truck license number qft682 so basically that brown um, uh, work vehicle that chris watts is using supplied by anadarko after that, we'll look at the 2016 Lexus RX350 SUV, and that was a vehicle that Shanann thought of as her own, license plate 528ZJV. After that, we will look at the evidence log based on uh, the uh, crime scene analysis of Dave Yoakum from the CBI, and then we will look at something that I think many people have either forgotten about, don't know about, or, or didn't realize the significance of Anadarko's GPS tracking at Survey 319. I'm not talking about the tracking logs per se, but the tracking maps. And then if there's time, it depends on how long the episode goes on for, we will look at some of the vehicle references in the discovery. And that will basically conclude the deep dive analysis from this channel. There will be a final episode dealing with your questions and uh, I'll tell you a bit more about that closer to the time. Uh, so one thing I might do after this particular series is an episode on Nicole Kessinger, just the True Crime Rocket Science position on her, um, what to make of the latest information, all that kind of thing. If you'd like me to talk about that, let me know. Uh, I do have a couple of thoughts that are certainly different to what I think a lot of other people and channels think about it. But if you're interested in that, let me know. Uh, meanwhile, if you haven't subscribed yet, please do like, share, leave a comment. If you do share, please use the hashtag TCRS. And let's get started. So I think the first thing to note in terms of the 2015 Ford Lariat F250 is that it didn't belong to Chris Watts. It was a company vehicle and as such um, he wasn't really allowed to drive uh, kind of drive around on errands so he didn't take that truck he didn't drive to the sand dunes with Nicole Kessinger towards the end of July in that truck in fact they went in her vehicle and her vehicle would be um, theoretically interesting to also talk about I think it's a Toyota Fortuna uh, but since it doesn't really strictly form part of the crime scene uh, we're not going to look at it but anyway that is the vehicle that they used to go to the um, sand dunes and in interestingly enough also the vehicle as far as I'm aware that they went to the restaurant the Lazy Dog restaurant on the Saturday night, the la their last day together, which is quite interesting. Chris Watts drove to Kessinger in the Lexus and then they went in her vehicle to the restaurant. 
And you may remember that they then went to another restaurant because for whatever reason they weren't happy with the restaurant. I think they were sitting too close to um, the exit to the kitchen or something like that. But for whatever reason they, they moved to another restaurant. Now, although it's not necessarily relevant, the retail value for a Ford Lariat and Chris Watts' truck was actually a hybrid. So it could use natural gas as well as uh, ordinary gasoline. Um, although it's not really relevant, a 2015 vehicle plus minus equivalent value recommended retail price would be around about $33,000 to $35,000, right? Uh, a Lexus, on the other hand, this is a 2016 Lexus RX350, would retail for around uh, $10,000 more than that, uh, at least. Um, hybrid models are $10,000 more than that. So anywhere from $43,000 to $53,000. I'm not 100% sure what the um, purchase price of that vehicle was at that time. I don't know if it was $60,000. Maybe some of you would know. Now, what is quite interesting, just in a broad way to be aware of, is even in the promotional material for the Lifetime movie, they actually depicted Chris Watts driving his truck. Um, that is like part of some of the, the main posters of the, the film and in the trailers as well. Another thing that I think is very important to emphasize is Chris Watts' identity for most of his life was a mechanic. It was a guy who was comfortable around vehicles, who uh, worked with cars. Um, he worked for a couple of years at the Longmont dealership, which is where, and his wife also worked there, which is where they met the Lindstroms. And um, Jeremy Lindstrom was, as far as I know, effectively Chris Watts' supervisor or boss. Um, and Jeremy Lindstrom's opinion was that um, Chris Watts was an excellent mechanic, like a master master technician or something like that, but just a very good mechanic. And so if you think about that, you think about a mechanic, what do mechanics do? They fix things, right? It's the, the vehicle comes in broken, what do you do? You fix it. You find ways to, to, to get the engine going again. And if you apply that psychology of fixing things, and you may remember in the phone data review, he referred quite a few times to saying specifically to Shanann, something's wrong, but I will fix it. I will fix it. And he said it quite a few times. I will fix this. And we know how he tried to fix it. He tried to fix it in a mechanical way, in a physical way. Even what he did to his daughters was sort of a physical thing. You know, if you think about um, the whole thing with... Um, uh, mechanics and engines they are often putting things into pipes and tightening things opening things unscrewing things closing things the the one thing that was maybe a little bit different was him digging a hole and, and raking it over if that makes sense and if there's an analogy to that I guess it's to do with being an oil worker when you're an oil worker a lot is going down a lot is happening underground a lot is happening beneath the surface of the earth that's unseen and maybe that psychology started to permeate. You might say, you might laugh at that and say it's, it's uh, th that kind of symbolic thinking is irrelevant, but it's not. Uh, criminal psychology does flow out of ordinary human psychology, which is in turn uh, premised on your identity, who you are, and who you are is in turn a largely a factor of what you do for a living. And just to illustrate that a little bit further, if you think about, so Chris Watts is a mechanic and that informs his psychology. Think about someone like Chair Day Bell, who's a grave digger and, an, and a writer, someone who, who writes for a living, and how that could have an impact on the events surrounding him. Think about that for a second, and th then you'll see how it does sort of correspond. 
So I'm not going to go into too much detail about the work truck other than to say that uh, it, even though it was Chris Watts' vehicle, he wasn't really allowed to enjoy it. Uh, he just used it for work. And um, as a result, he sort of shared the Lexus with Shanann. I think Shanann considered that vehicle hers. And so Chris Watts was sort of someone who would kind of borrow it from her and, and, and occasionally chauffeur her around in it, but, but otherwise not. What is quite interesting is Chris Watts got the full use of that vehicle for the five weeks where Shanann was away. And, and who knows what impact that had. In other words, just being able to drive that vehicle around a lot, a lot more than you normally would. So obviously the, um, the, the work truck is a double cab. It has a back seat area and because of the rear area, I mean it's a pickup, and because of what was in the rear area, Chris Watts couldn't, if he had um, bodies that he wanted to transport from A to B, um, he couldn't very well leave them on the outside of the pickup. And so the only area that he sort of had at his disposal was that sort of back seat area. And that is where he said during the second confession uh, where he um, put Shanann's body. In fact, he said it was between the front seats and the sort of back seats. And he, he said that his children's feet were on Shanann's body effectively. I mean, where else would they be? Also that he, he didn't take any car seats with in the work truck. And of, of course, uh, what he was doing if he was caught on the way there was potentially a fireable offense, not just, uh, you know, well, carrying dead bodies in his, in his truck would have been anyway. But I mean, the fact that he had children in his work truck and then children at the well site, this is now presuming they were alive. Chris Watts did try to, in terms of the vehicle, try to hide the vehicle kind of in plain sight and in plausible deniability. And what I mean by that is he simply th that morning drove to work. He lied to the officers saying that he left it between quarter past five and half past five when he actually left at about quarter to six and uh, he arrived there. He arrived there quite late, almost an hour later, at uh, 7 minutes to 7, which was actually late. And um, he, I think he, he lied about that as well He um, about 18 minutes earlier. Something like that, 18 minutes earlier, he said that he was on site when he was actually still on his way. And as far as I know, the, the work day tended to begin at Anadarko at... Uh, 6.30, but but you could p perhaps say 7 as well, between 6.30 and 7. So I'll tell you a bit more about what happened at the well site based on the GPS tracking map. But uh, you've got to consider if his children, one or both of the children, were alive when they got into the truck, that that was a completely new experience for them. They, they had never been in that work truck before uh, and he was telling them that he was going to take their mother to a hospital because she wasn't feeling very well and so that would be immediately a new experience for them also not being uh, strapped into a car seat as they were used to would be a new experience I doubt whether he gave them breakfast that morning I mean no food was found in their stomach contents so that uh, all of those things would be kind of a dis distressing thing compared to what they were used to. Uh, they weren't going to the well site in the kind of the, the, the luxury um, upholstered uh, setup of the Lexus. And if you actually look at the interior of the uh, work truck, it's, it's fairly dusty. Um, there's dust on the console and obviously dust on the tires and so on. I'm not saying that it was dirty, just that, you know, driving onto a dirt road is going to um, cause that sort of dust to build up. And that would be another thing that I think would cause the children to be upset, um, you know, that kind of thing. 
the fact that it wasn't a, a comfortable interior and there was effectively nothing to do nothing to play with uh, for the hour or so that it took to get from the house to the well site just in terms of the plausible deniability that I mentioned is Chris Watts having a spade uh, and s something like a gas can in the truck uh, in the in the in the bed of the pickup truck uh, and perhaps even a rake uh, could be somewhat plausible you know that because if you look at some of those well pads some of them look like there's not a stone or, or a tuft of grass in that uh, the area that is um, that is cleared and so something like a shovel I don't really know for a fact but because of the ground the way that they break ground and they clear areas you know in terms of vegetation and they, they dig kind of a um, uh, sort of a, a slab of earth where the, the, these well sites are I guess so that the vegetation can't catch fire and it's just kept very clear of debris and I guess something like a rake would be used for that perhaps even a shovel um, but based on that he could travel theoretically with that in the truck and it wouldn't necessarily raise eyebrows whereas if he was driving the Lexus with a shovel it, it might raise eyebrows just a final thing to note before we move on to the next section is on Watts' way home he passed um, a, another CCTV camera which picked him up coming down the sort of long end of Saratoga Trail so he wasn't taking the shortest route and the GPS showed that he did stop briefly at uh, six something Black Mesa and he would later admit that he'd thrown away his own clothing and other evidence we don't know exactly what uh, it might have been uh, containers it might have been uh, who knows even oxycodone uh, bot uh, tablet cases uh, the kids blankets we, we don't know exactly what he threw away but that was never recovered and that was thrown in, in a dumpster opposite um, a house that was under construction in Black Mesa and some of the cadaver dogs did uh, bark well a cadaver dog barked very excitedly there at, while I think someone was on the phone and they didn't really seem to pay any attention and yet we know for a fact that that, that uh, um, evidence that was probably filled with cadaver odor was disposed of in that area um, what is the other thing to note the other thing that is very uh, disappointing is that we know for a fact that there was a cadaver in the work truck and yet there's this um, I don't know like almost confusion were the cadaver dogs actually allowed inside the work truck it's hard to imagine that uh, if they were that they wouldn't have, have signaled um, bear in mind that w would have been the, the latest period that the cadaver would have or cadavers would have laid in in a particular place and um, they laid there for at least an hour that it's quite a long time for, for scent to pull and also it's a very small space um, so you know in terms of ventilating it um, it's it would be a little bit difficult so it that was something that that just was quite disappointing I mean if you had to think about it I mean we know from in retrospect um, if Shanann didn't leave the only way that they could have left was in the work truck and so put a freaking cadaver dog in the work truck and did that happen and the answer is unclear it's, it's a little bit unclear uh, about that I know the one cadaver dog showed interest along the outside of the truck and then uh, just the, c the discovery seems to contradict itself somewhat uh, around this somewhere in the discovery it seems to refer to um, a dog going inside the truck and another one showing interest on the outside but surely if, if, if the dogs had just been allowed inside the truck both would have confirmed the alert isn't that true now in terms of the Lexus RX 350 SUV 
uh, there are a couple of things to say about it. Obviously, he used that vehicle to go to the kid's birthday party. Um, he um, he was using that vehicle, through, as I mentioned, throughout the five weeks when Shanann was in North Carolina. In fact, she he, he actually put up a picture of the car on the driveway after he'd, he'd washed it. And... Um, I think Shanann said something about Chris is enjoying the bachelor life. And, you know, I think having a vehicle, you know, having your own vehicle to be able to use whenever and for whatever is a part of, um, it is a way that you kind of enjoy personal freedom. And that was actually a vehicle that Shanann, I think, considered her own. Um, I do think that... um, this vehicle, the Lexus, is kind of uh, misunderstood in a way. Um, I think a lot of people assume that Shanann owned it when it it was kind of like a lease and she was just paying off uh, an amount. I'm not even clear whether that that amount she was paying off would ultimately mean that she owned the car, but in other words, like a kind of a higher purchase thing. But it was a situation where Shanann had earned an auto bo- bonus and so Lavelle was effectively paying half of the payments that were owed and Shanann was paying the other half. As far as I know, Chris had also earned an auto bonus and that, that second auto bonus was going towards the one Lexus and Shanann was sort of making kind of a big deal that Chris was also going to get a Lexus, that they were going to have um two of these luxury vehicles and the work truck. And I think there's a little bit of evidence here in what is really going on with the Watts family. And what I mean is, if you just look at the the vehicle, the status of the vehicles. So there's a a work truck that isn't really, doesn't really belong to them. It's just um, kind of a utility vehicle. So that's kind of out of the equation. And then there's, there's another vehicle which you could say belongs to Shanann. She's gotten it via Lavelle. Although, if you think about it, there's almost an equal claim on the, you know, the, the fact that it's being paid off. It's being paid off with an auto bonus she's earned and another one that she's earned through Chris Watts's account, right? But the question I think you've got, kind of got to ask yourself is, um, okay, so whose vehicle was the Lexus? And I don't think anyone would argue if you said, well, it was actually Shanann's. So you kind of have a situation where, how do you want to argue it? D- does Chris Watts have a work vehicle and Shanann is a work vehicle? Or is it really a situation where Shanann is sort of acting as though this vehicle is hers and she owns it, but she doesn't really own it. She can't really afford it. Neither of them can really afford it. And, um, but it, it's nevertheless a situation where the, uh, the, the woman in this household owns a vehicle that's more expensive than the other vehicle, which her husband doesn't even own. And I think that financial equation, if you want to look at, look at it that way, is quite representative of what was really going on in the in the in the Watts family, and what I what I kind of mean by that is, Shanann sort of owned this really expensive vehicle, just more expensive than the the work truck, and Chris Watts sort of didn't own anything. He maybe sometimes drove the Lexus, but it was really Shanann's car, and he couldn't really drive his own vehicle when he wanted to, and so he's kind of pushed to the side, if you know what I'm saying. Um, a, a properly equitable scenario would have been if they'd owned um, three vehicles um, let's say the work truck for for work purposes um, and then one or two other vehicles for personal use presuming they could afford it and I would have imagined kind of a, a more economical kind of vehicle you might think that I'm being sneering or being unfair but you know I I own a Chrysler and um, it's 20 years old. It's still in pretty good shape, but I, but it's a 20-year-old Chrysler. 
and um, I think it would probably be worth the same as the Lexus minus ten thousand dollars and divided by about at least fifteen <laughs> that, that should give you an idea of of um, of certainly where I stand in other words I couldn't afford a car like that and Shanann was effectively selling something like chocolate bars and Chris Watts was effectively a glorified mechanic are you telling me that they could afford that vehicle now bear in mind that vehicle came along in 2016 a year after they went bankrupt and they faced bankruptcy again in 2018 so let's just join the dots in 2015 they faced bankruptcy and what what is the what is their response to that um, how do they downsize how do they learn their lesson how do they tighten their belts they, they acquire a Lexus a, a luxury vehicle this is actually a monster when you actually look at the vehicle um, you know in in from a, a few different perspectives it's a huge vehicle it's a monster and Shannon obviously used this vehicle to try and sell her Thrive fairy tale. She also used her home to sell the Thrive fairy tale. And towards the end, you know, towards the very end of the story, Chris Watts was saying, "Well, we need to downsize. We need to get rid of the house." I don't know whether that applies to the vehicle as well. I don't know whether it applies. You know that that he's going to you know get a different vehicle. It's, it's, it would be interesting to know what his views were on that, but we do know that he was Googling an Audi, uh, and the fact that he was doing that also seems to show that, that he was capable of spending a lot of money. Who knows, maybe he thought he would sell the house, uh, maybe get a smaller uh, apartment or a, a, a smaller house, but then spend big on another vehicle again. And, you know, there's, there's also the other alternative. You don't need to um, buy a big or expensive vehicle that's going to be a millstone around your neck for years. You can um, kind of be realistic and buy a smaller vehicle. Um, interestingly, Nicole Atkinson, when she got her auto bonus, was talking about getting a Tesla. And from, from what we've seen, I don't think she ever did. Um, and anyway, compared to the car that Shanann was driving, now bear in mind, Nicole Atkinson came to the party a little bit later. She was driving um, what looks to me like an appropriate vehicle, you know, not, not something that she couldn't afford. Does that make sense? And let's face it, vehicles are aspirational um, uh, assets. You buy a vehicle to show who you are it's like a statement of intent it's a, it's a it's a status symbol so you buy a vehicle to say this is who i am but equally like social media you can lie about who you you are you can be um indebted to the hilt or in debt up to the gills just to try and show that that you um upwardly mobile and very well off when you actually can't can't afford it So I, I would like to know if there are any of you listening who have been part of multi-level marketing schemes, if you, if you had a, a vehicle like this that you couldn't afford and what eventually happened, did you, did you give it back? Did you pay for it um, in the end and, and own it? Um, were you happy about the deal? How, how do you feel? I'm sure that there will be some people who will you know, who are multi-level marketers who, who want to recruit other people who will say how wonderful it all is. But I'm, I'm really addressing this question to people who have uh, gone through that year or two where you uh, realize, okay, this is totally different to what I expected. And, and then, you know, face that sort of financial ruin or whatever it was, um, who, who kind of, did you bite the bullet or did you, did you end up giving the vehicle back? what happened um, or do you know of other people you know what is their experience or is multi-level marketing the sort of thing where you join it and you can have 
like a fleet of 20 Mercedes Benz in your garage because that's just how it works. Uh, as soon as you join it, um, money falls out of the sky and it's just wonderful. And it's, it's okay if you don't sell anything, you just get cars and, and trips. I think I heard a um, video the other day where Shanann said she, she had been with Thrive for I think a year and a half and she'd already done six trips. She'd already done six um, trips uh, all across America and, and you know also to other sort of more exotic destinations. Uh, that's also something I can't compete with. I can maybe do one or two trips a year. I can't really do six in 18 months, I must say. Um, but maybe um, maybe it is a totally different ball game if you a multi-level marketer that 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 um, if you manage to sell enough um, chocolate bars that you you can make millions. You know that if enough people around you order like a warehouse full of chocolate bars, the profit from that is enough to buy a car. Is that how it works? So now we're going to go to the evidence log. And that is quite interesting. It, it's just the uh, actual evidence that was seized from the vehicles. And um, f there's quite a lot more in the, the work truck than the, um, what do you call it, the SUV. But what was seized was a round point shovel, a square point shovel. So there were actually two shovels, a sickle from the work truck which I guess is used to um, cut down uh, vegetation. A gas can from the work truck, which I think was half full. Swabs from the steering, steering, from the steering wheel of the work truck. Uh, a black plastic bag or black plastic bags from the floor of the work truck. Now those black plastic bags sound to me like they were like a insulation layer like a layer that was along the bottom of the work truck so that um, any odor and any discharge from Shanann would be sort of easily cleaned up and I think that something like that the blessed black plastic bags in the work truck uh, what are the chances that Watson didn't do something similar inside the house specifically inside the basement putting sheets of plastic on the ground um, while he was, um, you know, preparing to do what he was going to do on the driveway. Um, the driver's side front seat cover was also removed. The passenger side front seat cover was also removed. Um, the uh, black rubber boots from near the rear passenger side. Now, so what that tells you is... Um, when Watts returned from the well site, let's put it another way, before Watts returned from the well site, he removed his black rubber boots and put on other shoes. And those are the shoes he arrived in um, when he returned that day. And as far as I'm aware, I could be wrong on this, he r didn't return wearing the red wing boots because the red wing boots were found in the SUV. But it could be that he re he did re return in the red wing boots and later put those boots in the SUV. I just don't think that's the case. Also, a trace lift from the center console of the work truck and a trace lift from the rear seat of the driver's side of the work truck and the, another one from the rear seat passenger side of the work truck. So, um, you know, obviously if the case went to trial, you could sort of see what were these trace lifts? W w was that going to be evidence of the children? And what kind of evidence would it be? Would it be saliva? Would it be hairs? Would it be fingerprints? Would it be footprints? Uh, what was that all about? And then also interestingly, there was a cigarette lighter on the passenger side of the front door of the panel truck. And so, you know, what that could have been for, that cigarette lighter, it might have been to, to burn certain evidence. So if the evidence items from the truck are around about 
12 or 13 uh, labeled DY8 to DY20, there are only three from the SUV. Um, the brown boots from the Lexus, meaning the red wing boots, uh, which are fairly new. Um, and a white shirt from the Lexus. Now, I'm not sure if that white shirt is the shirt that he wore on his date. We know he did wear a white shirt on the date. Um, it's not clear if that, that was what was in the Lexus or why it was in the Lexus. And then uh, the final one, miscellaneous paperwork from the Lexus. Uh, I think there were things like bulls and that sort of thing. And so obviously what was not retrieved from the Lexus were things like Shanann's cell phone. Um, I seem to remember the the keys to the Lexus were found in, in the center console, but I could be wrong. And now we're going to deal with Anadarko's GPS tracking at Survey 319. This is potentially, there's a lot to say about this, but we're just going to look at the um, GPS tracking map and there is there there it is for survey 319 uh, what's arrived at 6:53 a.m and according to the gps was stopped for over two and a half hours it's quite a long time and i think at least one of those hours is spent um uh kind of digging a hole um you know raking over it putting the bodies of his children into the tanks um, and kind of dealing with it, with it as a as a disposal site, put it that way. I think he spent at least an hour doing that. He probably spent 20 minutes or so digging the grave and maybe um, five to ten minutes uh, in terms of each daughter putting them in the, the tanks. But then I still think he needed some time to um, do other things, maybe clean out the truck, maybe clean himself, um, you know, with wipes or something like that, uh, maybe clean the outside of the, the tanks. Um, but that's quite a long time that he spent there. And uh, Troy McCoy did say that it was very odd that he, he parked where he, he did. And we can see from this uh, schematic that he parked where he did because it was close to the makeshift grave it was it, it wouldn't be that far to to carry Shanann's body uh, I think he sort of carried it and dragged it but obviously that becomes difficult more and more difficult over rough terrain also he didn't want to um, bury her right by the periphery of that well pad he wanted to get some distance beyond that for a couple of reasons one is line of sight that you wouldn't easily just see the disturbed earth and also uh, probably he expected um, there to be a smell that he would need to manage and mitigate and so he would want to get her some distance from there and that's why he parked right on the periphery of the um, of the well site now I can't say for sure if that little section it looks like a little triangle above the green number two i can't say for sure if he uh reversed there after bearing shenan so that he, he would be relatively closer to the oil tanks but obviously well from from this schematic anyway it looks like he carried both daughters um a fair distance he, he didn't drive back to the almost a foot of that stairway to put the, his children in there and it, it shows you um, he was uh, I think he, he was very careful not to give away the fact that he was anywhere near those oil tanks that day okay so we are about 40 minutes in do you guys want me to deal with the uh, references in the discovery I can do that. I certainly don't want to do it for uh, all that long. Um, there are 523 references, so I don't want to go through all of them. But if we go through the first one, it's actually very early on in the uh, discovery. 
um, and it really refer it's interesting that one of the giveaways that something wasn't right with Shanann was the fact was a fact related to her vehicle the fact that her vehicle was there and she wasn't and the fact that the child seats for the vehicle were inside the Lexus um, and not taken into someone else's vehicle so I think that is definitely quite interesting um, so let's just go through these references so that was the main thing that that caused them to think something was wrong that Shanann hadn't taken her identification, money, cell phone, credit cards, children's car seats, but the vehicle uh, in particular. And that kind of stood out. So on the 15th at about 8.50, so at about the same time that Chris Watts was being uh, interrogated but but very close to the time that he he was actually confessing and talking about where the bodies were in fact about an hour or two after that um the the lexus was being kind of hauled away um so here sergeant bates says i secured the vehicle using evidence tape um he, had, he said I had to unseal the driver's door so the vehicle could be loaded onto the flatbed tow truck. The vehicle was then loaded and I followed it to the secured storage lot. Okay, um, what else? I was not sure whether this is officer Brent Manley. I was not sure if they left on foot or in a vehicle. Um, I did not see the recording. Okay. Let's not spend too much time on that. So here is some uh, references to the vehicle from officer Lyons. Jane's dog was later taken to Chris's work truck, which was parked there. Jane said that the dog detected but gave no hard command. However, the dog did not enter the vehicle and the doors remained closed. Why? That just to me is crazy because you could have gotten two uh, confirmed alerts on that Tuesday. I guess easy to say in retrospect. Jane stated the dog did not alert for any human remains inside the vehicle. So, yeah, this is why there's this contradiction. Right? If you go back to that, the dog did not enter the vehicle. The dog did not alert for any human remains inside the vehicle. Now, this could be that... Officer Jane, um, sorry, um, not Officer Jane, um, the dog handler Jane, I think she used two cadaver dogs. So that might account for what seems to be a contradiction. At approximately 18.30 on the 15th, I was asked by Commander Egan to drive Chris Watts' Lexus vehicle to the back of the police department from the front of 5th Street and coordinate with Watts' father to retrieve his bag. From the, So this is the impounding of the other vehicle. So the work truck was impounded um, also on the 15th. Uh, second... Um, and and then this Lexus was impounded before that and so they effectively lost possession of these vehicles uh, w once he was charged and so you can see here on this is discovery page 126 that 
the items that he was supposed to look for in the vehicle was a shovel um, sand and dirt work boots stuffed animals blankets black trash bags now some people have said well this is evidence of what they did find it's not it's what he was tasked to look for as per the search warrant and of course he didn't find stuffed animals he didn't find blankets um, I don't I think he may have found trash bags I'm not actually sure which vehicle this is referring to if it's the work truck that makes sense in terms of sand and dirt but work boots weren't found Oh, okay, so black work boots were found in the work truck. The the brown ones were found in the SUV, but no no stuffed animals were found in the work truck. Okay, I'm not going to go any further than that. Uh, there is some cloak and dagger where Chris Watts. Um, you know went out of his you know, I think uh, he was spotted by other people going out of his home to the um, his work truck and then I think driving to the Lexus or it looked like he was loading things from the work truck into the Lexus um, this is when he departed for um I think he, he thought he was going to the Thayers and then they saw him doing that and thought it was quite suspicious. They also followed him from the police department. This was Tuesday night, not Wednesday, when he drove in the Lexus to the Thayers and then stayed there overnight. Anyway, I'm not going to take it further than that. Uh, if you've enjoyed this episode uh, and you haven't subscribed, please do. You can click on the icon on the bottom left, sorry, bottom right. I will be doing a live stream Q&A but it will more than likely be towards the end of this month where I'll be taking some of your questions and I've already kind of aggregated a lot of the questions and comments I've noticed you guys have made over the past whatever um, month and a half and so if you've got any questions um, or if any questions occur to you over the next week or two I write them down and I will try and answer them for you. As I mentioned earlier, I might be doing an episode on Nicole Kessinger just stating the true crime rocket science position on her, um, which I think is a little bit different to a lot of the other channels. If you would like me to do that, let me know. Otherwise, uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend and I'll see you guys next time.